I'm your host, Dino Watt, and get ready to be inspired as you learn exactly how to own your role. And welcome once again, everybody, to the Own Your Role podcast. I'm your host, Dino Watt. Thank you again for joining us each time for really amazing information that helps you magnify your purpose and ignite your passion within your business. And the goal of our show always is just to bring you the best information possible so you can grow yourself, grow your business, and just live the life of your dreams. And today on our show, we're going to talk about the awesome world of investing, whether that be investing in real estate or in the market or wherever else. And our guest is not only has a very prolific podcast that he's had some guests on there that I love. You guys have all ta- heard me talk about from Chris Voss to Evan Carmichael, all these real leaders in their industry that understand the power of understanding investing, yes, but also mindset and also how to live your best life and be your best you. So today we're going to learn all about that from our guests. Before we get onto that, remember, as always, to make sure you subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and colleagues that you think would benefit from gaining this information as well. So that being said, our guest today is Stephen Pesavento. I love that. I got to talk to you about your name and how you got that name. And I know how you got the name, but uh, what does it mean? With a name like Dino, I'm always curious about names. Stephen, welcome to the show. We're excited to get in and talk with you about your expertise. Thanks for being here. Ah, thanks so much for having me, Dino. I'm I'm excited to jump in. And yeah, my last name is uh, Italian from a little city north of uh, Milan called Asiago. And oh. uh, it actually means strong force. So uh, cool. Know, fun fact. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's great. Everybody thinks my name is Italian being Dino, but it's actually Greek. But my wife Oddly enough, I would not be surprised if she did not live close to or in that city when she was uh, 21 to 23 years old. She lived in Milan, Italy and all around that little area there. So small world. That's very cool. Well, Stephen, one of the things that we do on this show is we always start off with our guest story because I believe story is what connects all of us. We all came from somewhere. We all have had those bumps in the road, those challenges, those struggles. So we'd love to hear about your story and how you got to do what you do now. Yeah, I mean, I'm like most, you know, most people, I feel like kind of average, you know, grew up middle class, lower middle class, two parents who loved me dearly, and yet they hated each other. And, uh, (laughs) you know, growing up, I always thought money was like the biggest problem in the world. Like we never had any of it. There was always stress around it. And, you know, that com- compounded with a bunch of other just challenges and trauma it just gave me this drive to go and figure out a different way of living. But I, you know, I didn't want to be broke. So I went the traditional route. I went to school you know, I started working in management consulting, kind of had the dream job for a business person. And uh, it was fun. I had a lot of uh, the ego that goes with it. I felt like I had the title. I was doing the cool thing. I had big clients, but I wasn't fulfilled. I didn't feel like a connection to a greater purpose was just a paycheck. And then, you know, when I look back, you know, as a little kid, I either wanted to be a chef like Emeril Lagasse or I wanted to renovate houses like Bob Vila. And so uh, eventually all of that uh, HGTV paid off and I got, I made my way into real estate. You know, I left management consulting, started working in tech, started a few different companies, some startups, and then, you know, failure after failure, lesson after lesson, I eventually made my way back to the thing that I was dreaming about when I was a little kid. And I started investing in real estate. And uh, I loved real estate because it was something that was simple to understand, it was something that, you know, everybody needs. But I think the thing that really drew me to it more than anything is that it's full of a bunch of dreamers. It's full of a bunch of people who mm. believe they can create a better life, that it's possible. And there's a lot of examples of people doing that. And so I was really attracted to that because I felt like I was always on this path from being very young, trying to learn how do I think better? How do I start changing uh, the way that I think and what I believe so that I could create a better life and not kind of recreate those challenges that I kind of grew up around? And what was the biggest challenge you found when it came to kind of rewriting, redrawing that blueprint that was in your mind about it? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge just vulnerably is that I didn't believe that I could do it. Like mm-hmm. I didn't believe in myself. There was there was this voice that kept saying like, well, you know, 
we didn't, people like you, you know, people like us, we don't do that. We don't have money. We don't have family with money. Like that's just not for people like you. You need to go and do the kind of things that we do work hard blue collar jobs. And, and then, you know, I obviously started breaking away from that. I started being around other people who are successful. And when you work in high growth startups, I was working with, you know, I partnered with a couple of guys from Stanford, computer science majors, top of their class, super smart guys. And I was like, wait a second here. I I'm, I'm on the same level with these guys. They think yeah. differently than I do, but I'm bringing stuff to the table that they're not because yeah. they're in a box and I'm in a different box. And so I started to kind of gain that kind of confidence. And then there was a point where I had this like, you know, moment of true clarity, something I can't truly explain, but all of a sudden I just was like, I got to do this and I'm an all in kind of guy. So I fired all my clients that I had. I was, you know, doing independent consulting for a while and I just went all into real estate and I went and found somebody to learn from and I didn't have any money because I spent it trying to build all these businesses and, and doing these things, but I traded my skills. I traded my ability to create great marketing and digital marketing and websites just to be able to follow somebody around. Mm -hmm. And what that led to was some confidence, started showing up to more meetings and meeting other people. And they'd notice that progress and they noticed that drive. And then one of those people became my business partner. I partnered with somebody who had, you know, 20 or 30 years of experience in real estate. And I was able to be that young guy doing stuff that he had never done and thought about doing, but he was able to be the, you know, the old timer who had the credibility and the experience. So we didn't screw things up that he knew how to do. And that first year I bought 75 houses in two different cities wow. across the country, you know, $300,000 a piece. And I did that for a couple more years. And, you know, after that first deal closing, I realized like, oh, I can do this. Like, this isn't made up in my head. Like, this will work. And, uh, you know, that's how it started. Well, what you did is you took the action behind, even though you had that, whatever you want to call it, imposter syndrome, scarcity mindset, whatever, you actually just kept leaning in and pressing forward. And then something happened because you did the action. Now it didn't happen after the first day or the third day or the 30th day. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I actually can do this. I don't know if you're like me, but I don't still, I still sometimes feel that pop up, you know, depending on the room that I'm in or whatever. But I remember the pressing forward, taking the action to get me to that place of like, oh yeah, I can do this. What, um, what gave you that confidence when you were like, you know what, I do have something that they don't have because sometimes, and you've met people where it just, it, it stops you dead in your tracks or it has, stops people. In your tracks. Maybe some of those people, you know, family members, whatever that you look at and like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. What was it that triggered you to go? No, I'm still going to push forward. I think it was this, this feeling of looking back at where I had started and where I could have ended up if I would have stayed on that same path, you know, growing up in a pretty rough household environment mm -hmm. and learning a lot from those parental figures, but also learning like, whoa, I don't want to bring this into my life. And some of that blue collar mentality, you grow up pretty rough and tumble bikers type gang people where you're like, wow, yeah. this is like yeah. a whole nother world. And then you get out of that and you start seeing yourself in a different light. And I started breaking away from, you know, the hardcore partiers and the escapism and, and all of that. And I just made a decision at some point where I was like, I am not going to be that person and I'm going to prove it to myself and everyone else. And that was the chip on my shoulder that got me through some really hard times and to continue to break through. And then you get to the other side and you actually have to, you have to, you have to totally change what drives you. And yeah. so for me, it was like that, that thing that drove me was great, but it wasn't going to allow me to be able to live a good life or a fulfilled life if I didn't let go of that. So I spent, you know, <laughs> the, the next phase of life learning to let go of that and connecting to a greater purpose and spirit and all these other things. And I'm still on that path. Yeah. But because of that, it kind of allowed me to kind of make the next step. And then, you know, it also helps when you go to masterminds or you go to events, 
and you hear somebody's story up on stage and you, you like the guy, you care about the guy, but you're like, this guy is a total idiot. <laughs> I, I can do, I can, if he can do it, I can do it. And you just start believing. No, it's true. Right. Cause first of all, that chip gets real heavy, right? Even yeah. though it might help you get through, there's a point to where you're like, wow, this isn't really serving me anymore. But I laugh probably too hard at that comment because <laughs> the, the, the group will be unnamed. But I remember being in an event uh, networking group, sitting around, and, and I'm not joking when I say at least 60% of them, the people in that room, who were incredibly successful, easily, most of the, I will say, multimillionaires, billionaires in some case, that would sit there and talk about their addictions or their third or fourth marriages or the, all the stuff. And I, I remember having that moment of like, geez, if these guys can build these amazing businesses and they're addicted to you name it, or, yeah. you know, aren't happy in their lives and their marriages, I'm not, I, I, I'm doing pretty good and I should be able to do this then. Like there's, what's my yeah. excuse? Yeah. yeah, it's true. It's, it's really interesting. Why um, do you think you were, you were pulled towards real estate versus any other type of investing? Cause there's other opportunities out there. Was it, was it that idea of beautifying something, creating something, giving people that American dream, if you will? What, what was that? Yeah, I think it's a number of things. I think one of them was the literally the fact that I grew up, you know, watching HGTV, watching this old house, <laughs> seeing like these really terrible looking buildings turned into something beautiful. Yeah. And then also that combined with the idea that, uh, it's something that everybody needs. I love taking things that are rough in shape and making them amazing. I love being able to take and make something awesome. And it, it was just fun. Like it was just kind mm. of a fun thing. And it just was a thing that was in front of me because originally it was tech startups and tech startups are great and people are full of dreamers, but that whole model is built on don't make any money or revenue just fund the thing and hope to get enough users. And then hopefully somebody else will acquire you. And this was a business that, you know, you could start without a lot. The entry point was fairly simple. Now, most people are not building the business that I was building, but when I took those two components together and, and I just saw the possibility of what was there, I had already, you know, I'd never owned a, a, a property in my life before I had bought 75 houses. It was probably house a hundred or so when I bought my own personal home. Oh, really? Okay. So you didn't even start with your own personal. I didn't even have a personal home. And wow. before that, when I was starting these other businesses, um, I had essentially self-funded bootstrapped everything by running Airbnbs back in 2014, way before it was a thing. Wow. Um, I went on vacation. I met this beautiful woman. She lived in another city. And I decided to throw my house on Airbnb to go visit her for a weekend. And I, it, I got paid to go and hang out with this beautiful woman. And I came back and I was like, oh, snap. Like, this is, this is it. I went and got two more buildings. Uh, I didn't own them. I rented them. Uh -huh. But I was essentially 4Xing my rent money on average, sometimes 7Xing. And uh, it was simple. And so that was like, I never considered it real estate until years later. It was just another hustle. And I'd always done a lot of hustles. Yeah. But then when you kind of put those pieces together, it's like, oh, man, like anybody can really do it. And I don't really recommend everybody goes out and starts to be an operator because, you know, it took me three years of flipping 200 houses before I realized, wow, this is not this is a new job. I'm yeah. getting paid a lot of money, but it's a job. And then I got into private equity and we buy large multifamilies. We run a debt fund. We've got some other investment strategies out there. And again, bigger asset, better returns, actually easier to manage, but another job. But the mm -hmm. thing I like about the net, the phase that we're in is that it's all about partnership, you know, mm -hmm. in the single family space, you know, it's sending a hundred thousand mailers a month. We're doing all kinds of crazy marketing stuff. Yeah. But it was super transactional. You know, we'd, we'd buy somebody's house and somebody doesn't sell their house for 70 cents on their dollar twice. And they weren't high level thinkers. They weren't thinking from this place of like, how do I create a great life? 
they are in survival. And yeah. so I was like, the next iteration needs to be surrounded by people who have a higher level of thinking are thinking about creating a great life and we can create a 20 year relationship. So that was kind of the next evolution. And that's really what we do today is we teach and train people how to think like an investor, how to invest in private equity. And then whether they do it with us or they do it with somebody else, uh, they can actually go out and kind of create that, that life that they want to create. And then of course we run our own funds. And so a lot of people end up partnering with us because, you know, we're really focused on that relationship and, you know, a lot of people aren't. What is the thing that you find, especially nowadays, that is uh, preventing the mindset from thinking more abundantly and thinking like beyond just the sale of this house or whatever? Because there are people who I'm sure listening to this that, you know, they're busy, they're running a business, they, most of them are some sort of private practice owner. They've got multiple other people that they're thinking about and caring about to making sure those paychecks get paid. But when it comes to that next level, it's hard for them to see. It's hard for them to think bigger than where they are right now. What, what do you think is the biggest limiting belief that you see happen? I think the biggest limiting belief that everyone experiences in every way and in every chapter of their life is that most people, you're comfortable where you're at. You're comfortable with what you know. Hmm. It's because it's what's right in front of you. It's what you've already done a number of times. If you invest in the stock market, you're doing it because your grandfather did it and your financial advisor did it and all of your buddies did it. And when you look at doing something new, you're like, oh, well, this is scary because I don't know that much about it. But that doesn't mean it's not good. Just like if you're a chiropractor at the beginning and you had never done it before, you went to school, you learned a skill, and then you were able to go out and practice that skill. And now you look back and you think, oh, hey, I'm really good at this. This is what I do now. And so when it comes towards becoming an investor, even if you're really busy, even if you've got the family, all of those things, there's really only two or three steps that you need to follow to actually start getting involved in these things. And to simplify it down, it's you got to gain the skills and knowledge and experience. So you got to start understanding what is it that we're talking about when it comes to investing? What's the upside? What's the downside? How do I find a good opportunity? Who are the good people who have opportunities? How do I find the right partners? You got to then find using that skills and knowledge, you got to find the right advisors, the right experts. And to put that clearly, that's people like attorneys and CPAs and investment advisors and operators and coaches and mentors, the people who can guide you to say, nope, this is a really good deal for what you want and you should get involved. And then third is to do it. And maybe you start off small. Maybe if you're just doing a $50,000 investment or $100,000 investment. You're not putting all your eggs in. You get comfortable. You start getting that experience. And just like everything else, you start to get to a point where you're like, wow, this works out. But if you only do one investment, it doesn't work out. You're going to be in a position where you're going to think, man, this doesn't work for me. So it's always better to start first, gain the skills and knowledge, get the mentors, and then work from a plan so that you've got a diversified portfolio of things that kind of go together. And mm -hmm. if you're new to it, you're thinking, well, man, that sounds complicated. And at first it's going to seem like that, but it's pretty simple. And then once you start wrapping your head around that stuff, you can, you know, you can start to feel the benefit of what that is. Well, it seems like it could be complicated if you don't do what you said just that 60 seconds ago, which is finding the right people to help you get there. It's way yeah. more difficult when you're trying to do it on your own. Yeah, it's and and unfortunately, I think a lot of people, myself included, we get to this place of like, you know what, I, I can just figure it out. Oh, I just I'll just do it. And it's like, man, so much easier to shorten that pathway when you actually have the right people. I know that one of the things when I was reading through your bio and stuff that you you really like understand because you studied the principles of success, right? And and what entrepreneurs do, business leaders, investors in order to hit that level of success. Uh, are there any specific like areas where you've discovered the majority of people focus on X or Y versus what kind of the general population does? Yeah, I think what I've found is that the most successful people, you know, I've 
the, the first hundred episodes or so of the investor mindset podcast, which is my show, I've been doing it for about four years, million plus downloads, interviewed a bunch of really cool people. The first hundred episodes were essentially me having a conversation that I wanted to have where I was like, you're super successful. Tell me what you did. Nice. And then after doing it a hundred times, I got bored. I needed a new thing to be excited about. So I started asking different questions, but some of those first things that I learned or some of the most common things is that successful people are always focused on challenges as opportunities. And what that means is when they're feeling that feeling of like, well, shoot, I want to do this thing, but I don't really know how to do it. They're like, great. There's a problem. That is where the profit is going to be. So mm -hmm. how do I solve that problem? So the challenge is, oh, well, you're in your business and you want to sell your business and you don't really know how to do it. And you're not sure who to get involved and you're not sure if you should work with a business broker. Well, the opportunity is you need to start gaining some skills. You need to gain some knowledge. You need to go talk to some different people, have some different conversations. And through that process, you start to gain the confidence and on the other side of it, you've got the solution. Like a really great example of this is actually Richard Branson, okay. super successful. You know, whenever he goes and starts a company, he's always thinking like, okay, well, what's the problem with this business? What's the downside? And how do I protect against it? And a great example is Virgin Airlines. When he started that company, he started it. There's a great story why he started it. But he went to the uh, manufacturer of these planes and he struck a deal with them to essentially remove the biggest problem of starting an airline. And the biggest problem is that it's extremely capital intensive mm. to go and buy all these planes. And it's extremely risky to lease all the planes because if the, if the airline doesn't make profit in the first year or two, the whole thing is going to go under and you're going to be bankrupt. Wow. And so what he did was he struck a deal with them where he said, hey, I'm willing to buy planes from you. I'm willing to pay maybe a little bit more, or I'm willing to work out this, this deal where I promote your brand using my brand. But if the business doesn't work out, I'm just going to give you everything back. I'm not going to owe you anything. And so that he took the biggest problem, the biggest barrier of entry in that industry, and then he found a way around it. And so if you can think like that in your business, it puts you in a really, really strong position. And the same is true for investing. Yeah, that's uh, that arbitrage, right? Of, hey, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to uh, eliminate a lot of the risk for both of us. And we can part way, part way as friends if we need to, but we're hopefully going to have a crazy success there. Is that something that you've been able to implement in your business? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of ways that we kind of hedge against the downside. So mm -hmm. one thing that's kind of core, and it probably started all the way back when I was flipping houses and it probably started all the way back when I was broke, flipping stuff on Craigslist and eBay. And it's all about finding a deal. Broke guy loves a deal. Yeah. Rich guy loves a deal. Sure. And the benefit of getting a good deal. So when I go and buy a piece of real estate, I'm not going to pay current market value. Sure. Right. I'm going to look at that. I'm going to say, hey, well, you know, what's wrong with it? What's the problem? What's the relationship? How can I get this for 10, 20, 30, 40% below what it's worth today so that I'm starting out ahead? No matter what happens, I'm in a better place. And then you look at, okay, well, what are other ways to hedge? Well, if I know that if I renovate this unit and I've done thousands of them, that I can increase the rent by $400 a month. And I do that across 200 units. That's a pretty big chunk of money that comes in. And because real estate's valued based on the income that comes in, NOI, net operating income, that I know that that's gonna increase the value. So when I pair those two things together, I got it at a discount and I know that I can force the value, even if the market was to drop by 20 or 30%, I'm still ahead. Right. I'm still making money. Right. And so that's one way we hedge against the, that. The second way is that when people invest with us, we've got pure alignment of interest. It goes back to that 20 year versus two year relationship mm -hmm. piece mm -hmm. yeah. where I get paid 90% of the, the income that comes to the company comes from the success fee, comes from mm -hmm. the performance fee. So 
investors are going to get 60 to 80% of the profit on the deal. They're going to get most of the money. And so what that does is one, we're in total alignment. If you lose, I lose. Cause that yeah. means I just worked for five years and I'm not going to get paid. And the fees sure don't keep the lights on. Sure. We only really like keep this thing going because we know that success fee is coming. Right. And then the second piece of that is just like, just like anything, if I can get you hooked and addicted, you're going to stay forever. Mm -hmm. If I'm giving you an incredible return, then I know that I can rely on you for a partnership for a very long time. Yeah. So if I treat you really well, great. If you treat me poorly, I'm going to fire you as a client because sure. again, this is like all about, we want to have a good relationship. I want to feel good. I got rid of the chip. So every day I want to be in a state of flow. And so it's like these types of things allow us to set up a business that we can greatly reduce the risk, greatly reduce the downside and create something that's very long-term focused. And not everybody's thinking about it like that because a lot of these syndicators and a lot of these businesses that are in the investment space, they make money no matter what happens. Um, and it's more risk for us, but what it does is it creates, you know, real raving fans. So right now we're in a weird place, real estate wise, right? Like obviously you do your homework. You've got a lot of, uh, uh, people on your team doing some research as well. I'm sure it's not just you. Let's talk about the state of the market right now and why or why not investing in real estate. And I know you invest in other things too, but investing in real estate in this case is a potential opportunity for people. Yeah. So right now, from all the data that we're seeing, we're kind of in the trough of the market. In other yeah. words, like if you look at long-term perspective, the market's gone down, things have gotten really challenging, less deals are selling, less deals are trading hands. And so we're at this point, we're Money's probably at the anymore. low point. <laughs> Money is not free, debt is much harder to get. And so we're at this point where not a lot of transactions are happening. And so the reason why it's a really good opportunity is that it's not a good opportunity everywhere. Meaning generally across the industry, I'd say it's a neutral to not an opportunity. But the opportunity lies within the niches because one of the benefits of private equity, real estate is part of private equity. The benefit of private equity versus public is that insider trading is not only legal, it's expected. So when you insider trade, when you have insider knowledge in the public market, yeah, you go to jail. Yeah, Ask Martha yeah. Stewart, she yeah. did a little stint. Yeah. But in private equity, it's it's the name of the game. So I have very detailed information on what's happening in specific markets around the country. Mm. And then we especially focus in, in Denver, where our office is located, because we have so many relationships with people. We know what's trading before it trades. We know where they're going to build a Costco before the permits are actually pulled. We know what's happening. So because we can know that information ahead of time, and then we have really good relationships with brokers and with owners and with people who want to lend debt, all of those things allow us to do deals, but we traditionally would only prefer to buy buildings that are two to 300 units or, you know, large buildings because it's the same amount of work to buy a 40 unit as a 200 unit. It's actually more work to do a 40 unit, but the, the challenge, the opportunity in the market right now is that there's some large buildings that you can buy at a discount, mm -hmm. but they're much harder to find because these big New York firms and LA firms that have billions of dollars are sitting on all this cash that they raised years ago, and they need to find a home for it. So they're buying up stuff, they're overpaying for it, it's not making any sense. But in this middle market, where you can all these mom and pop owners live, and in Denver, that's like the that's like the five to 15 or five to $20 million number. The big funds won't buy smaller stuff because it's too much work for them to do from out of state. Sure. It's too much work for them to, to even fly out to check out the property. So what we're doing is we're actually buying up all these smaller buildings. We're pooling them together into one vehicle. And then in five years, we'll sell it to one of those large funds because now it's a bigger package type of deal. There's a bunch of examples of stuff like that that we're doing. But that's kind of how you take advantage of what's happening in the market. Because the biggest reason this is happening is because the cost of debt went up. The amount of debt that 
that banks will lend has gone down. So it requires more equity, more investor capital into a deal, which brings down the returns. Meanwhile, investors are able to get five or five percent from the Fed or four or five percent from a CD. So they're like, we need a higher return in order to be making these investments. Right. So it's that time in the market where you want to be building relationships, where you want to be committing capital to the right type of strategies, or you want to be investing in debt funds where you can get, you know, six, seven, eight, ten percent and wait it out until there's an opportunity that you like. Wow. So pretend you're a brand new investor. You don't know what you, all the stuff you know right now, and you run in to Steven on the street and you say, Hey, I've got X amount of money. I need to invest. I'm a late investor. Haven't really invested since, you know, I'm 55 years old, whatever. Where do I start? What's the best place for me to look at right now to start Besides mindset, my mindset's ready. I'm good. I'm ready to go. I'm abundant. What do I do? Yeah. The, the thing you do is that you meet me on the street, you talk to me and you ask yourself, well, what, what was that feeling? What am I taking away? Was my intuition telling me about this person? Do I trust him? Do I not trust mm. him? That's where you start. And if you don't trust him, you know, run away. That doesn't right. mean that that person's not good. Maybe your intuition's off, whatever. But you got to start out from that place of trust. The second thing you need to do is you need to then say, hey, well, what is it that he's doing and where can I learn more about this, both from him and from other resources? And then you get a great advisor. We happen to have certified financial planners on our team who go out and their job is to help people kind of make these plans and get clear on what they're supposed to do. And we offer that to our clients for free because you know, it's just a value add. It's part of that long-term relationship piece. But let's say all of that happens. You get to the place where you're comfortable. You feel like you have enough knowledge. You're not just jumping in blind, but you're making an informed decision. You're going to just make, you're going to make your first investment. If you've got a million dollars to invest, you're going to invest $200,000 in four or five different deals, or you're going to split that up over two or three different deals. You're not going to invest all of your money into one bucket. You're going to spread that out into a couple different opportunities. And then you're going to watch. You're going to watch and see what happens. You're going to start to read the reports. And you're not going to read the reports from a place of what's wrong. I'm in fear. You're going to read the reports and ask questions from a place of how do I understand this more so that I can make the next decision from a new place. And that's why it's really important to have that relationship with an operator to have, make sure they have the team in place to be able to answer all the questions so we have a team of people who can talk to you on the phone because I can't, you know, we have hundreds of hundreds of people who invest with us, but you know, I'm here, I'm this person, I'm happy to talk with you after you've talked to our team and you know, yeah, yeah. those kind of things. But what I would say is the biggest thing is you don't just jump in and start funneling your money. If you don't have knowledge, if you don't have that relationship, if you don't feel that trust because that's where it all starts. It has to come from, it's not about what you invest in, it's who you invest with. Hmm. So what should I not do then? Like, I know I gotta do everything you just said. What should I absolutely not do? Well, I just shared two things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just jump in without mm -hmm. having any clue. Um, mm -hmm. And you shouldn't put all of your eggs into one basket, mm -hmm. meaning, if you've got $5 million, you just sold your business, you don't put the $5 million into one fund. Right. If you were going to invest with us and you're like, hey, Steven, I got five mil. I want to put the five mil into your deal. I'd be like, what's your personal net worth? Let me, we got to verify some information. And then you'd, I'd see that it's all of your money. And I'd say, nope, you can't. And I would cut uh, it back dramatically. Not everyone I was going to ask you, like, do you have any people that, have come to you horror stories of that. It was like, I'm just so desperate, fearful that here's just everything. I've had people who've come to me like that and we don't let them become clients until they're out of that state of mind. Nice. Because it's a part, if you think about it, it's like we're getting into like little mini marriage. We've got a clear beginning, middle and end. We're going to have a fun little ride together and then we can just renew the marriage over and over again. 
but I don't want to be married to you if you're a crazy person. I don't want to be married <laughs> to you if you're somebody who's making this I decision because you just, you know, you just got out of a bad thing. I want to come into it when you're like, yeah, I know who I am. I know what I want. I know where I'm going. You know, everyone can have their moments and everyone does. Sure. sure. But that's, that's really, it's, you know, it's super important to us. Do you have a, a I always love, like I said, of beginning stories. Do you have a story of, a, of a really cool outcome of someone who maybe was a little skittish? Obviously you helped them with the mindset, but love to hear any, anything you got on that. I'll give you two. I'll give you one story that's really cool. And then I'll give you another story on the mindset piece. So All right. I have this client. It was back when we were buying houses in Minnesota, North Carolina. And it was this, uh, this senior woman, she's probably 55 or so, maybe 60. And she's selling her house. She's going to move to Texas because all of her family's down there. And we can't pay what she needs us to pay for the house. She's stuck on the price. So we buy it from her seller financed, meaning she's the bank. So she essentially loans us like 150 to $200,000. We buy the house, we pay her a fixed interest rate, and then we flip the house. We're done. We sell it. We go to her and we say, Hey, love for you to invest again. She becomes a lender in our debt fund and she starts getting just monthly payments. She's just getting paid. And then we have in, uh, uh, an apartment opportunity. And it's something that's new to her. It's exactly the same thing. But all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, well, you're making 8% here. And you're going to make 18% by investing in this other deal. And she's like, whoa, dude, 8% is good. 18 is too much. Like <laughs> too much. there's got to be something wrong with this thing. Isn't like, that I don't know. Right. Like people, that's, what's funny. Like higher returns scare people. Yeah. But in our world, they're common. And so anyways, she doesn't invest all of it. She invests 50,000 and 18 months later, we way outperformed the project. We were planning on doubling her money in three years. We tripled her money. So we returned 150,000 to her. And, uh, you know, obviously she continues to invest with us and it's great, but it's incredible because it's this path of, she was comfortable with little steps along the way. And she got comfortable with us because she saw the results. And then she got into something that was way out of her wheelhouse. And, you know, now she's a raving fan. She's trying to refer people to us. Her own family members don't get it. They don't understand it. Sure. So of course, they don't jump. And, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Before you go into the next story, I just, I, I love that story because you think about this woman in her life and all the opportunities that she probably feels like she missed out on and, the whatever. I mean, when you live to be that age, you've got stories, right? You got stuff. And here she has this small opportunity, takes a really a, a leap of faith with you to do the owner seller financing, turns out well, and just continues to roll that over. The amount of insecurity and fear that you've negated in her life is staggering. And you think about that with the amount of people in this world, especially around that age, especially single ladies that didn't have those opportunities or didn't know about those opportunities. That's, that's super empowering for her and for you as a company. It's super empowering. And maybe instead of telling that other story, I'll just kind of shift over to this. But what's, what's fascinating is it's like the older you get, the harder it is to change. We happened to, she was in a situation where she knew she needed to sell. She needed to sell by a certain date and she was connected to the price and she wanted to make it easy. So it was because of her situation that she was willing to entertain something that was out of the norm for her. Right. She's a very smart woman, was like an IT consultant for decades. Like she's sharp, she gets it, but she had never done it. So as her situation led her to be in a position to try something different. Had we not bought her house, she would have never invested with us sure. because she didn't have a reason or a purpose to change. But then after having that reason and purpose, she then started seeing the benefit, started seeing how it worked. I mean, been investing with us for like almost seven years, six, seven wow. years. It's been a long time. And over that period of time, she's had incredible changes, incredible benefits. And even from that place, it's still probably hard for her to believe mm. what is happening. 
because yeah. it takes that repetition. And so what you'll find and what I've found in my company is that there's a lot of people who are older, you know, older than 55, older than 65, I'd say that invest with us. But I'd say it's way more people that are in their 35s to 55 or 35s to maybe right on the 60 that are getting involved in these kind of things. It's because their mind's just a little bit more open to these opportunities, these ideas. And the older you get, the more cautious you get, the more afraid yeah. you get. Yeah. And so it if you're a business owner and you're running your business, you're going to make the most money continuing to reinvest in your business. But there's a certain point in time when you want to take some chips off the table, when you want to diversify, or when you sell the business that you want to say, hey, well, how do I pay for, pay myself forever um, and create those streams of income? And that's pretty much what we teach people to do. Well, and what a great lesson that story is of caution for the 30, 35, 40 year olds of don't wait, like don't get to that place. She's completely changed her life. And yet you can do this sooner. Like you don't have to wait until then. So that's, that's awesome. What do you find is the thing that brings you the most excitement on a daily basis of what you get to do? The thing that excites me the most uh, at the deepest level is helping other people. It's that mm -hmm. moment where I know that a change is happening. It's that moment where I know that they, that I entered a conversation that was already happening in their head and I was able to help move it forward. In other mm -hmm. words, like real change, like that's, what's exciting to me. The money isn't exciting. Like I love money. It's a fun game. We play it but the impact is what really drives me. And so that's been the, the new phase of like where I've gone to in my life where it's like, I run a business that's about making money. Like it's the money business. Yeah. We take a hundred dollars and we turn it into two. We take two and we turn it into four and we take four and we turn it into eight. We take eight, we turn it to 1.6. It's like you, you see this compounding effect and you know the logical progression of what that does. But what's really exciting to me is actually impact of knowing that I'm not only having the ability to impact one person's life, but I'm having the ability to impact their whole lineage. Yeah, because generational if, income, yeah. Because if you're the person who all of a sudden gets clear on your vision, you name your number, you get clear on how much you need to live the life you wanna live, you get clear on what that dream life looks like, you create a plan to get there, you start seeing that it actually works, you're going to be in a totally different position in five or 10 or 15 years than you would without it. And so I know looking back that whether or not those people credit me, not that I need the credit, but I'll know internally that that action literally will change the life of their children's children's children, as yeah. long as those lessons are passed along. So when you talk about naming your number, like you just did, I know this is really important to you to have people really focus on, come up with, create that number. What does it do for somebody when they have that solidify? when it's true, right? Because I think, oh, a lot or more, right? But you're talking about an actual number. What, is, what do you see it do for people when they have that, when they've really thought it through logically, what does it do for people in their mindset? Naming your number is so much more than setting a target. What it's really doing is getting you to, to step into the place where you're focusing on one thing, one specific target, and then building the, the evidence, building the, the argument, building the strength behind why it's so important for you to hit that number, and then a, a plan that actually gets you there. So when you name your number you and you get clear on the amount of money that you need to earn to live the life you want to live and then that money comes in recurring passive every single month when you get to that point and you've gotten clear on the vision how you want to feel what do you want to do with your time what kind of impact you want to make how does your family feel what are the kind of things that you want to be able to provide to them that that are experiences, that are lessons, et cetera, et cetera. When you can connect to that type of depth, it really changes everything. It puts you in a position where if you're working, the work that you do has purpose because the purpose now is to earn money, to invest in assets, 
that eventually will fuel that life that you're creating, the change that you're creating. So it's a simple activity, which anybody can do. You can sit down and ask yourself, well, how much does it cost to live the life I live? And how much is it going to cost every single month to live the life I want to live? And oftentimes mm -hmm. those really aren't very far apart. Yeah. Uh, and then you get clear on that vision of your life and then you start doing it. And part of doing it, of course, is investing. Part of doing it is getting the assets. Part of doing it is getting the skills and knowledge. But when you name your number, you start focusing on the right things and it kind of brings together all the important things in your life into one place. Mm. Love it. Wow. Like so much great information, Stephen. Um, I can't believe our time is, is close to an end. I know that if people are really paying attention, it's not just real estate is the, is, is the vehicle to create the happiness and the life that they want. Real estate, investing in it, understand whether, whether it be real estate or not, whatever it is, your way of, and the way that you explained the aspects that you focus on is really just a vehicle to help people become and live their best life, live their happiest life, live their most freedom life. And I think that's an incredible service that you, you do for the world. It's got to just bring you so much fulfillment and joy. It's super fun. And as long as I keep staying focused on that, then I feel like I'm in alignment and all the good things happen. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful to have kind of found this, this path and this journey. And for all of those of you out there who are interested in learning more about doing that for yourself, the Investor Mindset Podcast is a great place to start. Nice. We've got a lot of great free resources. Um, if you want to put together your own vision plan, if you want to name your number, we've got uh, a great process that you can go through on your own. It's part of a, a larger course and training we do, but you can do that totally for free. And you can grab that at investormindset.com slash planner, uh, the investormindset.com slash planner. And, you know, from there, if you're interested in getting involved or invest or for mentorship or advising or anything along those lines, feel free to reach out. I uh, would love to connect with you. And, you know, I think the stuff that we talked about today, I'm passionate about because I know how much it's changed my life. I've yeah. seen it change a lot of other people's lives. And I know that it can make an impact for you too. There's nothing like seeing it affect yes your life but then when you see the ripple effect for other people it's amazing it's awesome thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us today before we close i always have four questions that i ask every single guest before we end are you willing to play i am i got a hard stop though so i gotta jump oh so let's let's do it real quick okay <laughs> all right uh, what is the highest and greatest responsibility that you have on this earth? I think my, my purpose for being here is to help people live a better life. It's to help people heal and change and, and grow and really kind of live up to what their potential is. And the way that I'm doing that today is through all the stuff we talked about. That's amazing. What do you want as the ultimate outcome for your life? I want to be able to look back on my life, on my deathbed, or from whatever greater power or purpose or, or place that we all come from, I want to be able to look back and say that I made a difference, that I helped other people create the life that they were meant to live, and that I was a part of something much greater than just focusing on myself. Beautiful. What do you consider true leadership to be? Leadership is is understanding how do you figure out what other people's geniuses are and then how do you bring those together and then how do you inspire those people to work on something that's really big and impactful and then get out of the way nice last question you just mentioned uh the time in your deathbed we all have that moment that will happen to all of us so between now and dead what experience do you hope or want to have the experience that I look forward to having is just knowing that I was a part of doing something really big and that, you know, I left a, a dent on humanity. I love that leaving your dent in the world. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for those amazing uh, answers and all the information you gave and for everybody listening. Thank you for joining us again on another episode. Please, please reach out to Stephen 
and get the information that you need to get so you can actually create the abundant life that you can see Stephen has as well. Thank you, everybody, again, for joining us on the podcast. Remember, our goal here is always to help you magnify your purpose and ignite your passion. Thanks so much, Dino.